Okay, so I'm going to uh, do this presentation some of this paper that uh, uh, I put out with uh, Rahul Ilango and Igor Oliveira. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I, I came to this project was a bit by accident. Like I had a, what happened was that I had like a competing paper, <laughs> more or less on the same topic, and then we got together and uh, wrote the paper. Uh, but I should say like kind of the main result of the paper is theirs. And, uh, and that's what I'll be talking about. And, uh, uh, so let me start this in. So the paper is about this problem or this, I, I actually think about it as like a family of problems uh, called the MCSP problem, uh, which stands for minimum circuit size problem. Um, and uh, like the vanilla version of the problem is you are given a Boolean function uh, F on n bits and some number s and um, and you think that the boolean function is encoded by its truth table let's say uh, so by the two to the n length string of zeros and ones and what you want to learn is whether what you want to know what you would like to output is whether you know some true or false whether the size of the smallest boolean circuit for f is at most s okay so that's kind of a simple problem and uh, it's trivial to see that this problem is in NP. So the witness uh, for this fact is the circuit. You guess the circuit and, uh, and, uh, and you check if the circuit computes the truth table that was given to you. Uh, like oh, that depends on the fact that uh, the circuit can be exponential in N, but uh, so is the size of the input. Yes. Since you are giving it by a troop table. Indeed. Yes, yes. And so, so although the input to F is n bits, actually the size of the truth table is 2 to the n. So, you know, any circuit for F uh, will have size small. I mean, any circuit that you'd care about for F would have size at most 2 to the n by n or something. So, uh, so that, would, that would work. Okay. And, uh, Right, and, and the open question, like it's the main open question in this whole topic, is whether this problem is NP hard. And uh, it seems we're kind of very far from understanding this. Uh, it could be an NP intermediate problem. Uh, but you could also consider kind of the analog. Um, Bruno, there's a yeah. question by Ronald. He asks oh. if this depends on the gate set. Uh, whether. You mean whether it's open if MCSP is NP hard? Well, is there some sort of equivalence that if this problem is NP hard, let's say if you use the Morgan uh, the Morgan gates, uh, or if you use bigger gates, uh, you, right, you can so, consider, you know, like say threshold gates with input size n. All these things kind of matter. Right. Yeah, they do matter. Right. So because here you're kind of asking about like, is it is it exactly? You know, you're asking about the size of the small circuit of F exactly. Is it? You know, there will be like a a fixed, it's either less than S or larger than S, but you could consider like approximate version of the problem where, um, you know, maybe, maybe you, uh, I'm going to mention it, I think. Oh, there we go. Right. So, so you could think of a variant of this problem where you consider hardness of approximation, right? You want to distinguish the case where the size of the small circuit for F is set, say less than S to the one tenth, mm -hmm. or it's bigger than S to the 10th. And then you can ask again, is this problem uh, NP hard? And if this problem is NP hard, then it will be NP hard. It doesn't matter much what the gates that you choose mm -hmm. because you expect the sizes all to be within linear factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Or small factor. Yeah. So for the exact version, it does matter actually, the gates, but if you're starting to talk about hardness for approximation, then not, not in there. Uh, of course, you can consider kind of a, an analogous problem for other models, you know, size of the smallest formula, size, number of leaves in the smallest protocol, size of the smallest branching program, combinatorial measures like uh, partition size or um, uh, bounded depth circuits like EC0 or TC0 or something and so on. You could think about measuring the complexity of uh, kind of the small of other types of tasks. So here we we're, it's like the complexity of computing a function, but you could think of uh, the complexity of computing a partial function, solving a search problem. Uh, and what we're going to look at today, which would be a multi-output function, where you want the same circuit to compute all the bits of f of some of, of some multi-bit output function. 
uh, some other task like distribution generation, anything that you can think of. And uh, when you ask whether the problem is NP hard, you can be thinking about different kinds of reductions, right? Like such as many one reductions, Turing reductions, randomized reductions, and so forth. Uh, Have people also considered alternative descriptions of the functions? So, True yes. table has a fixed size and the more interesting functions must have some um, more succinct representation in some format and then the size the problem changes right indeed so uh, there for instance there were problems uh, i guess i'm going to mention that I, I can mention that later on but so so for instance you can think of the size of the smallest dnf for a function and it's it's kind of it's trivial to prove that if you encode f by some sort of if f is a partial function say and you encode it by uh, uh, the pairs x f of x where f is defined, then it's very easy to see that this is NP hard. But it's uh, but it's much harder to do it if f is a total function or if it's a partial function where you have to say every pair whether x is defined or whether f is zero or whether it, if f is one. So whether you have to say which of these three. Do you get something like minimal equivalent expression then? Uh, minimal equivalent expression, what is that? So, which is, uh, so you're given a, a circuit and you ask what's the size of the minimal circuit ah. that computes the same function. Yes, that's, that's actually. Somewhere in, somewhere in the polynomial hierarchy, as like, so I see. like sigma two or uh, something like that. I see, I see, I see. And, uh, and this makes the problem completely different, right? Because mm -hmm. you somehow you give a compressed version of the truth table. So in principle, it will be much harder uh, to, to solve the problem in that size, right? Because the compressed version will be much smaller than the truth table. Exactly. So you have a lot less yeah. time to actually solve it. That, so all these, all these things are make for different flavors of the problem. And kind of all these things have been considered. I think even like uh, problems where you give the encoding in some way, and uh, you want the smallest. So uh, I kind of think of these things as I, I put these things under like some sort of topic called meta complexity because you're asking what's the complexity of computing, the computational complexity of some problem. Uh, okay. Uh, now I'd like to say a little bit about how I arrived at this problem, and. Um, I guess, uh, like all stories, I was trying to prove some circuit lower bounds and failing. And uh, I started thinking kind of very general terms, like uh, how does one prove a circuit lower bound? And um, and kind of one strategy, like one of one thing that we saw a lot uh, uh, is uh, using some kind of strategy called a natural proof. Uh, for those of you who don't know, so a proof that a function f is not in some circuit class C. Uh, such a proof is called natural if uh, the way the proof works or, from, or from, the, from the logical reasoning of the proof, you can extract some kind of property of, of functions. And this property should kind of prove like if this property holds for some function g, then it should be true that the function g is not in the circuit class. Okay, so it's kind of it this property is some sort of witness that the function is hard. Uh, and uh, the proof is called natural. If this property can be computed in polynomial time when given the uh, truth table uh, of the function. And this property should hold for a random function g. So if you toss a, a Boolean function uniformly at random, if you choose one, then this property should hold. And uh, kind of a very important paper uh, in 1995 uh, showed that kind of all the known circular lower bounds that were known at the time uh, are proven by natural proofs. Uh, you know, with the caveat that maybe the original proof isn't itself natural, but you can extract some natural proof or some natural property. Uh, it's called such a proof called natural property from the proof. Uh, however, uh, it turned out that, uh, you know, if uh, if you could prove circuit lower bounds uh, but using a natural proof, then you could use this property to break all possible pseudorandom generators. So you would have no pseudorandom generators and people kind of believe that you have pseudorandom generators. And, uh, and so if you believe that, then you should also believe that there is no, um, there is no natural proof of a super let's say circuit lower bounds. 
Uh, and this kind of changed a little bit. Uh, at least I think this is kind of the first example that I know of. Uh, well, in in 97, there's this paper by Rosa McKinsey, of which I'm a huge fan. I think it's maybe one of my favorite papers in all the plexi theory. Um, and what it does is it separates the monotone and CRP. So if you think of like monotone circuits where you have no negations, you can still define like uh, polynomial time. And uh, in particular, you have circuits of polylogarithmic depth and that gives you the NC class. And it turns out that the, what they've shown in this paper is that um, uh, if you have a depth log n to the three, then you can do, you can compute more monotone functions than you can with monotone circuits of depth log n to the two, uh, say. So they separated, and this for every level actually. Uh, so they separated the, the monotone hierarchy. And this proof is actually via some sort of non-natural argument. And uh, uh, the reason, and it failed, and it's not natural actually for two different, it breaks the naturalness in two different uh, ways. First, the argument will not, you know, the kind of property that you can extract, you can extract a property from this uh, that makes a, that makes a function have, not have these circuits, but the property that you have does not hold for a random function. It actually uses some structural property of the function. So, so it's already not natural for that reason. But furthermore, it's actually not, the, the property does not seem to be in P. Like the, if you take the property and this property does show lower bound for like a family of functions, but you cannot seem to uh, compute the property in uh, the side of the property polar uh, Okay. And uh, so nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, uh, kind of every single lower bound proof that I know of against some complexity class C, and I'm here talking no, no longer just circuits, but uh, you could have communication complexity, anything that I know of, uh, or that at least the ones that I thought about it. Uh, does still produce some kind of property phi that uh, you know that shows that a function is hard. Like if you get it, and this and this property actually can be computed maybe not in p but in NP. in np. Um, we know what, what about diagonalization? Uh, right. Uh, that well, that's actually sorry, my bad. So that's actually there's an exception to this, and the, the exception is diagonalization. I'm glad you mentioned that, Harry, because I actually had told you this already, right? But I forgot to mention. So, so there, there are some kind of arguments that don't seem to produce something like this, but all of those that I know are basically the, the ones based on diagonalization where you simulate some program and do the opposite. And, and these arguments seem to escape kind of this, well, let's say like every combinatorial lower bound proof that I know. I'm going to qualify this statement as much as I need to until it's true. So, um, so, so every combinatorial, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, um, Okay, so but uh, so so what does it mean that you have this property? So it's a property that witnesses hardness, right? That shows the hardness. It implies hardness, and it's an NP. That means that there's some kind of notion of efficient short witness of hardness. Uh, uh, so right, so I'm going to repeat the claim. So every known lower bound proof that I know of produces some notion of efficient short witness of hardness. And actually, so Ryan Williams has a paper in 2008 that shows that any separation of a function from, uh, you know, if you show that there's a function f which is in uh, non-deterministic exponential time, but not in p poly, but doesn't have polynomial size circuits, any such, if this result is true, then there is such a property phi. So somehow you can, in some cases, you can actually prove that such a property, the existence of such a property is necessary. And what I was working at the time was kind of, I was thinking, is there some sort of universal notion that would work for any function G? Uh, so here's kind of the, what I was wondering at the time is very vague and broad, but and kind of hopeless maybe, but, but still I was thinking about it. So, um, so okay, so it likes some, something like a function phi, right? Let's think of this property phi. It's a computable in polynomial time. And the property that you'd like to have is something like this. If the circuit size or protocol size or, uh, size of the branching program or something is bigger than some threshold, then there will be, there will exist a witness that will cause, so there will exist a witness and um, this witness would have size, let's say polynomial in this threshold, and this will cause the program to accept. So if I give the, if I give uh, the function and the witness, then the program will certify, yes, this is a witness that F is hard. However, if the, if the function is not complex, so it, it has small circuit or small protocol or whatever, 
then no matter what witness I would give to the program, it would say, no, this is not a witness that F is not. So I was thinking along these lines and, uh, and then I realized um, that this is basically, what you're just doing is asking whether there is some approximate version of this MCSP problem uh, in Cohen P, right? So, I'm, I'm, so this is basically the uh, approximate uh, MCSP, and I'm asking basically whether there's a Cohen P uh, algorithm for it. Uh, however, if, if this problem is NP hard to approximate, then no such universal notion of witness of hardness can possibly exist if you assume that NP is not Cohen P. And this is kind of how I arrived at the problem. And uh, what got me started to think about MCSP. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and you, you know, there, there are some, so there's some generalization of natural proofs, uh, which shows that, you know, if, if you have pseudorandom generators that fool some kind of Cohen P-like tests, then, then in particular, you kind of have this um, kind of universal notion of witness of hardness. Uh, but, you know, who knows if that's true. So, right. Uh, yeah. So, but I mean, just to get into to this a little bit, but, but can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. So, it, but it is true that, I mean, if you turn it around, then it is, then we do have, like, if you turn the exist W and for all W around, mm -hmm. th then we do have such a witness, which would be the small yes, circuit, yes. I guess. Right, indeed, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, you know, so, you know, you have, if, if the function is easy, you have a witness that it's easy and you'd like to have some kind of duality. You'd and like now you that. Want also a witness that it's large. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you'd like to have some kind of efficient duality, like you have in a linear program or in a semi-definite program. Uh, right. And uh, and in fact, so and th so this MCSP, this is actually what I was thinking in terms of duality, uh, and then I realized that just, of course this is the right thing to ask. Uh, and, and if you kind of believe that this MCSP is NP hard, and in some cases you can actually prove it, then there's no such dual witness uh, and uh, which is kind of mind-blowing <laughs> and upsetting because so somehow you know somehow if you have such a property f such a universal property phi uh, that tells you that a function is hard and it's a property in NP like if you have something like this then you know what a proof that a function is hard looks like it looks like a witness to this uh, program that you have it looks like this w that you get feed in but if you don't have this, you actually have no idea what a proof of hard that something is hard looks like. Uh, uh, I mean, there's some concrete. I, okay, so that's. I, I kind of I deeply wish that this was true, that there was such a function. But of course, this would. I mean, many people conjecture that MCSP is actually NP hard, and and then this will simply be false, and uh, and then we would have no idea actually what, what proof. Of, I mean, there's some statement precise statement that you can make that says we actually have no idea what a proof that something is hard looks like um, uh, in general uh, for any question. Okay. All right, so uh, I said this is very broad and kind of vague, so let me just uh, go down to earth a little bit more. So, so let me talk about previous work. So uh, we do know that uh, for certain weak classes of circuits, this problem is NP hard. Uh, what we know currently uh, for DNF, so for instance, I, I give you a function f, I give you the truth table, and I ask what's the size of the smallest DNF for this, and this was proven to be NP hard by uh, Mazik in '79, and then uh, proven to be NP hard to approximate even under I guess a log log n factor, which isn't a log, because remember the input size is two to the n, but, uh, by Allender uh, and a bunch of other people and uh, Cot and Saket. 2008 independently. And even if you have a DNF of XORs, so now you have like a depth tree circuit, uh, then this was proven by uh, Hirahara Oliveira and Santana in 2018. And actually, I forgot to put it in the slide, which is stupid and I shouldn't have. Uh, th this is actually known now for AC0. It's, it's, a, it's an unpublished work uh, by uh, Rahul Dilango, and it's the proof is actually amazing. I was really impressed. <laughs> when he presented it to me. So that's something to be excited about that's coming out at some point this year, I guess. Um, we also have some, some results um, 
that showing that this NCSP just for normal circuits, Boolean circuits, is hard for classes other than NP. For instance, it's NC1 hard and there is C0 reductions. So, um, um, and it's known that it's actually uh, hard for this class called statistical zero knowledge. Uh, so, so you can, you, for instance, you can reduce graph isomorphism to NCSP and polynomial time. And this was proven by Elmer and Das in 2014. But, but um, so here mm -hmm. for which class of circuits? Uh, for which class? Oh, this is just MCSP, just vanilla MCSP. Okay. For, uh, yeah, so for circuits, Boolean circuits. Uh, yeah, indeed. So, so it's, it's, it's not NP hardness, but it is the vanilla problem, MCSP. Uh, and there's some sort of, there's like also a bunch of negative results. Uh, you know, you can show that this MCSP is not NP hard and there are various kinds of weak reductions for its projections where you just take bits from the input and you pl place them maybe at different positions. Uh, uh, and, that, and that's your reduction. And then this will not give you NP hardness. And, uh, and there's some results that, yeah. So I'm still confused about this SDK uh, result. Isn't it saying that SDK is in NP because we know that the MCSP is in an NP, right? Yes, SDK is actually in NP intersect co NP under some of the randomization oh, okay, assumption. Okay. Okay. Uh, and maybe this reduction is actually randomized. So uh, I actually don't know. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, indeed. So SDK is in AM intersect co AM. So, so probably this reduction is random. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah. Oh, uh, there's also these kind of negative results that say that if your reduction is weak, so not that weak. So if you just take like deterministic polynomial time, many one reductions where you want, you know, you want, uh, X is in the language, if and only if some reduction G of X is in MCSP. Uh, then if you could prove that MCSP is NP hard and there's such kind of reductions, then it would follow that you could separate exponential time, deterministic exponential time from BBP, uh, which might, which doesn't mean that it's not true under these reductions. It just means that it would be very hard to prove. You would at least along the way need to separate BBP from X. All right. So that's kind of the, right. That's the previous work that I covered. And uh, now I can tell you what our results are. Uh, uh, so we showed the following. So we show NP hardness for MCSP, for various kinds of MCSP. And the, our main result is that uh, if you want to know the size, so suppose you are given like a total function, which is a multi-output Boolean function. So you have as input n bits and you have as output n bits. And size of f would be the size of the smallest Boolean circuit under standard basis, which computes such that for every output bit of f, there will be a gate in the circuit that computes it. So that's the size of f. And uh, it turns out that approximating the size of the small circuit for a multi output function f, even up to a constant factor, is np hard. Uh, Okay, so the same thing will happen if uh, if for for a single out, single bit output function, if it's a partial function, and I instead of specifying the entire truth table of the function, I only specify a list of pairs x f of x, where f is defined, then approximating the size of f uh, is also up to linear factor is also n p hard. And here, uh, Peter's question actually is important because actually the size, you know, the F can be defined on only on very few inputs, which makes the input very small. And, uh, and that's actually used crucially in the, in the proof. Um, uh, so so this, this, this is likely to not give you any real hint on how to solve the problem for total single bit functions. Bruno, also, can I ask a question about the first item? Yes. So you don't know how to prove this for m equals one, right? So you need to have some sort of lower bound on m for this proof to work. Yeah. What we need to assume? M is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> exponential so in m. Exponential in m, indeed. Oh yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Bruno, uh, mm -hmm. why does item two not imply that it works uh, for, for a single output? Uh, 
functions because I mean I just take the list of all the all the pairs, all the x f x. Yes, because for the functions that appear in the completeness gadgets, uh, the number so let's say it's a function on n bits, the number of actual inputs that you're looking at is something like two n. Out of the two to the n possible bits, you're just looking at order n. So 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 the input size to this problem can be made right right so it's just very tiny. But what if I make it the whole truth table? If you make the whole truth table, we don't know how to prove it, even if even for a partial function. Yes. So suppose that the input is actually the list of pairs x, b, where x is an input, and you go over all x's. So it's you have two to the n pairs, x, b, and b is either zero, it's defined in as zero, one is defined in as one, or star, the function is undefined. If I give you that as input, then we don't know whether and on all I, again, all I'm asking is uh, the size of the smallest circuit, which agrees with F on the non-stars, on the zeros and ones. And we don't know how to prove that this is NP. Hard, but, and in but fact, what if, so. what if my function is total? Mm -hmm. And I give, yeah. it, I give it all the pairs X comma FX. Isn't that the, just the old, same old? Uh, yeah, that's the same problem as before. But then, I mean, then you must have some more restrictions on results. That, then you have no evidence that these are hard instances. Right. In fact, these are not hard instances because, uh, I mean, the, the, the reductions. So again, so that the functions that appear in our reductions are just defined, are undefined almost everywhere except for a very small set of inputs. And I since mean, I the statement is you give an F for which this is true, I don't understand this. Okay, so the statement is uh, consider the following problem. I give you as input a list of pairs x, f of x. Uh, sorry, I give you uh, as input a list of pairs x, b, right? The input x and some bit b. Mm -hmm. And I want you to compute the size of the smallest circuit which agrees with this list. Yeah, but the statement should perhaps be a small list of pairs. A small Otherwise, the, in the input gets too big to prove NP hardness. No, no, they, but, but I, I just, I'm just asking, it's just this problem. The input is a list of pairs, and I want you to yeah. give you the size of the small circuit. Yeah, but then the area small is, what if, instances what if you take where it is hard, but yes. uh, the general problem, if this thing gets too big, it may become easy again. Right. Suppose, I, suppose yeah. that I consider the promise problem, where you need to specify many pairs. Right, you need to specify, my, let's say. Yeah. I understand my confusion now. You, you, if you sort of, in addition, also consider these partial functions, then you can prove it's NP hard. Hmm. Uh, yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, sort of, indeed. Yes, yes. Sorry yes. For, for my uh, misunderstanding. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, indeed. So, of course, the problem, the problem is only as hard as the other one, right? If I ask you to also tell me the, the size for where f is partial, then it's only as hard as the other one. But it turns out that we can actually prove it's very hard. It's empty hard. Uh, okay, so, so we also have like a bunch of results about, uh, uh, also like uh, we have the following. So if I give you like a partial two-player function f, uh, so Alice gets n bits, Bob has n bits, uh, and there's some, it's some promise problem, right? So. It's a partial function, and I'm asking you to give me the size of the smallest or the, the, the smallest communication complexity. Sorry, I'm asking you to approximate the communication complexity of this function f, the deterministic communication complexity. It turns out that this is actually also uh, NP hard. And the reduction is actually not hard. It's very easy reduction from chromatic uh, uh, number. Uh, so, so I think that kind of the, the, the most interesting result of the three is the first one. And um, and so I, I, my plan is to prove it now. I don't know how much time we have. We have like half an hour, so I think that should be enough. I think uh, that's my plan for the rest of the talk. So, so any questions? Uh, so I can state what I'm going to prove. Uh, so I'm going to prove that it is NP hard if I give you the truth table of a total multi-output Boolean function to approximate the size of the smallest circuit f, which computes it. Uh, all right. 
And this is going to be a reduction from uh, a set cover problem. In the R bounded set cover problem, our input is a family of sets. Uh, so it's a family of subsets of uh, n, of uh, 1 to the n. Uh, uh, and th the, the promise is that the, all the sets in the family, if you take the union of all the sets in the family, then they cover n. And, um, but every set in the family has size at most r, and r will be some constant. And the output is the cover number. Uh, of this family, meaning the smallest size of a, of a subfamily of these sets that still covers the entire uh, domain. Okay, so that's the R-bounded set cover problem. Okay. This problem is known to be NP-hard to approximate. Uh, these sets don't have to have empty intersections? They do not, no, not at all. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so these sets can definitely intersect, and in fact, they have to. Uh, but isn't it easy to see that covering with triangles is a special case here? Uh, yes, covering with tri uh, by triangles you mean sets of size three? Yes. 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 So that would be like the three bounded set cover problem. Yes, and that's already NP hard. That's already NP hard, but uh, but I, I believe that in order to get it's not NP hard to approximate, and we're going to need that actually. Uh, oh well, it probably has some approximation uh, factor, which I don't know what it is. So uh, w what seems to happen is that if I want some Isn't approximation, the consequences of the PCP problem that basically all the classical problems are hard to approximate. Uh, well. Uh, not all of them, right? Uh, I guess, I don't know. Is that true? Maybe that's not true. Uh, it depends on what you mean by approximation. Like, uh, uh, yeah, it, I guess it depends on what you mean. I think these constructed special instances um, where approximating was hard. It was not hard for the full class, but they constructed a special subclass of problems where it became hard to approximate. Uh, oh, uh, maybe. So is that, I don't know if that's a general, is that the super, I, I don't know actually, is this the same like for every problem? I guess not. I don't know. So, I mean, different problems need different constructions. Uh, maybe it's true that every problem is somewhat hard to approximate, but here we're going to need like some kind of something very specific. Problems uh, like NetSec are very easy to approximate, and it's a very classical NPR. Problem. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. So uh, you have these, uh, you know, for any factor of approximation that you want, you have some dynamic algorithm that uh, can do it. And for just, articles too, I guess it's easy by just greedy method. Uh, for for what case? For R equals two. For oh. R2. Uh, I believe so. For R equals two, it's already in colonial time. Yeah, it's it should be. I mean, you just sort of greedily do it. And it, okay, and it will it'll just work. Uh, I think so. I'll believe you. All right. No, I just I would guess. Okay. For R equals two, you presumably can do, reduce it to a maximal matching problem, and that's polynomial time. Oh, I see. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Good. So for R equals two, it's uh, for R equals three. It might still be somewhat hard to approximate. Like if you want to cover, but I wouldn't know what the exact constant is. Uh, we actually need a constant to be like four or something for 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 our reduction. Uh, and then I don't think that R equals three would help would give you for uh, this. Uh, so, so the, the, the hardness that we're going to use is proven by uh, Luca Trevisan, and uh, it basically says that for every constant alpha, which would be the hardness, uh, the approximation factor, and every language in NP, so I, what, I, what it says is that this R bound, there's some R for which this R bound problem is hard to approximate up to a factor alpha. Meaning, if I have a language in NP, there will exist some R, and I think this R only depends on alpha, so 
the R, the, the quantifier should actually be after the alpha. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and, and a polynomial time computable reduction, which takes some input X to this language in LP and outputs uh, an instance of this R bounded cover problem and some number K. And the property that you have is that if, uh, if X is in the language and the cover is at most K, but if X is not in the language, then the cover hat is going to be at least alpha times larger than K. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the hardness of approximation result for, uh, for the R bounded set cover problem. The thing to understand is that if I want a better approximation factor, if I want alpha to be larger, then I'm going to also have to require the, the sets S to be larger. But there is some, you know, for, each, for every fixed alpha, I can find some constant R. Uh, which works. All right, and, uh, and now, so our main theorem is actually some reductions. So uh, there exists, so the theorem says that there exists some randomized polynomial time computable map. So it's actually a randomized reduction, uh, which uh, takes an instance of set cover uh, and outputs some multi-output function f and some number k and here, this multi-output function is like a function on log n bits, roughly, uh, of input, but it has polynomial number of bits of output. Uh, and, um, and this function is such that, uh, basically, if I know the size, the, the size of the smallest circuit for f, I can approximate uh, the size of the small, the covered number of this family uh, up to a factor of four. What's actually going to happen is that um, the size of the smallest uh, cover number of, of for f minus k is going to be at most the cover number. And this will always happen, no matter what the choice of the, of the random coins in this reduction. And with high probability over the choice of the random coins in this reduction, uh, this will, will actually also be lower bounded by a quarter of the cover number. Right, so that's, the, that's kind of the main uh, theorem. And the plan is to prove that in the next 20 minutes. I think. Okay. So, so your final result is under. So, so the NP hardness is under randomized reductions as well. Yes, indeed. So the NP hardness of this uh, multi outputs uh, MCSP that only holds under uh, randomized reductions. Uh, which is meaningful, right? Because actually, so it turns out, so we have these results that say that MCSP cannot be proven to be NP hard under certain weak reductions without some breakthrough in complexity theory, right? So you couldn't prove it to be NP hard under the deterministic many one reductions and without proving that X is not in BPP and so on. But there's no such result known for randomized reductions. So it could just be that randomized reductions are enough to prove that MCSP for total single bit output functions is hard. Uh, oh, there's no, will, no obstacle to that. You will need to use Trevisan's result only for a single fixed value of alpha, and therefore you also have a fixed value of R. Uh, yes, indeed, yes. Uh, it, this is just to prove that it's NP-R, but you could also, it's like, but, but uh, you know, our bounded set cover is NP-R to approximate for every, um, for every constant alpha, right? So I can, if I make my constant alpha larger for the hardness of approximation of set cover, I can also make the hardness, the constant for the, for the size of F larger. So it turns out that size of F is actually hard to approximate under any constant. Since you have this number one four quarter in the separation you are claiming, um, yeah. that already tells that only a alpha one quarter or maybe yes. slightly large because of the case will suffice yes. for proving your hardness. Yes, so alpha, yeah, alpha equal four or something is enough to prove NP hardness. Yeah. But, but oh yeah, so one question about that. Um, but you subtract this K, right? Yes. So it's not immediately yes. obvious to me that, that you get a hardness of approximation of size because of this subtraction of k. Oh, you're right. Uh, of course, you're right. Uh, uh, that's right. Oh, wait. Um, oh, I guess you're right. Wait, uh, that might be a problem. 
I'll have to think about that, but this is true. Uh, Uh, because if you can only approximate this up to a constant, uh, if k is very large, then you're screwed. Oh, you're right. Well, I guess you're right. Uh, actually, I had thought about this at some point. Actually, maybe we don't actually get hardness of approximation precisely because of this well spot flaring. Yeah. Uh, we will get uh, hardness. Right, that's right. Sorry, my bad. So I retract that claim. Actually, we don't have hardness of approximation. It was just me uh, when writing the notes for this talk that made that mistake, which I actually had made it in my mind and corrected it at some point, but but then it propped, it propped up again. You're right. So so actually, so let me say that uh, we don't have this hardness of approximation up to a constant factor. Uh, actually, we only have NP hardness, just vanilla NP hardness. So it's still open hardness of approximation. You're right. And in fact, this the, the very problem that you point out will screw you over here. Thanks, Mario. <laughs> so, I guess I guess you could now have additive approximation. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can have some kind of additive, but it would be a weak one. It would be a weak one because this k is basically dominant over the leftover <laughs> uh, leftover size, as we will see. You're right. So all right. So so from this theorem, you actually don't get hardness for approximation. What you get is only just vanilla NP hardness. So that's still. Can you accommodate for the minus k by just adding another circuit with known linear lower bound um, of an appropriate size to get rid of it? Uh, Something which requires then 2k. Uh, right, but then, but then what would happen, I think, is that the input size would be very large, right? And, uh, and then the size of the truth table would explode. Because you do need to specify the entire truth table. It's a multi-bit output function, but you do need to specify the entire thing. If I understood your question. I see, I just wanted to. I'm still thinking in general descriptions of functions. And right. then you can presumably do this trick, but if you have restriction to true table representation that right. affects the size of the input in an undesired way. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so the trick is really getting like this. This has to work where I specify the entire function. Uh, right. Mm. Okay. All right, so, so now I'm gonna draw a little bit. So I'm gonna give you like the basic idea for the um, reduction, uh, okay. Um, this is the multimedia part of the talk. So, um, so, so, so what are we given? So we're given a family of sets, right? Given S1 up to, let's say, SU, let's just, uh, and it's a family of sets of, of subsets of N. And um, what we want is we want to produce a function. Um, uh, and I want that size of F somehow tells me something the size of the smallest circuit for F is going to tell me something about uh, the cover number of this family, the size of the smallest cover uh, of this family. And here's the idea of the reduction. Okay, so I, I'm, going to, I'm going to produce a function T. Uh, let's let over, uh, forget this. So, so let's look, so I'm going to produce a function T and this function T will accept, uh, it's a function that accepts M bits and outputs one bit. Okay, so let me draw here the domain of T. Uh, so actually the function t will be chosen uniformly at random from such functions and I'm going to have m to be something like uh, 4 log m. So, uh, so the size of the domain of t is something like n to the 4. And then I'm going to take this domain and I'm going to break it up into subsets, into, I'm going to partition it into n parts, p1, p2, three, et cetera, right? I'm going to break it up uh, into n parts. Right, so, so what's happening here? So, so I'm thinking of here of the, of 
of all ambits, all ambit strings. There are like n to the four of them. And I've broken down this set into n parts. So each part is going to have something like n to the q of them. Actually, I think that this constant three can be improved to one maybe or two. But anyway. uh, OK, so now I think of each part as being, as corresponding to one of these n elements in the domain. So I can define, for example, uh, uh, all right, so, so, okay, so now I'm going to define the, uh, the functions ti to be the, uh, as, as follows. So the function is going to be equal to t on part pi, and it's going to be equal to zero elsewhere. Uh, so meaning, so ti, for instance, t1 is going to be just equal to t on this set, and it's going to be zero elsewhere. That's t1. And I'm going to define also t of sj. Uh, okay, so, so now remember, I have these subsets s, which are subsets of the domain n. And I can also define for each such set, I can define uh, t of sj to be equal to just the or for i in sj of ti. Meaning if I look at the drawing, right, the S, sj is some, is some choice of, of elements from one up to n. That corresponds to some of the parts. These are the parts that correspond to the elements that are in sj. Say sj could have part one, part three, and part uh, seven. And uh, then tsj is going to be equal to this function t on these parts that belong, correspond to SJ and zero elsewhere. Now, here's uh, some intuition for how the reduction works, um, which turns out to be almost right, or almost, well, it might be right, but uh, it's almost possible to prove. <laughs> so uh, so the, here's the conjecture. So, uh, Oh, maybe, maybe I should say the following. Maybe I should say the following before writing the conjecture, which is that uh, if I want to compute t, right? If I want to compute t, this function t, I want to compute t on every part, I can just take an or of, of, of tsj's uh, for all j's in some cover In some cover made by s's, right? So I have these s, I have these s one up to s n. They cover all the parts. You can think like each each s i each, each s j is some choice of the parts, right? And the function t s j is equal to t on those parts that are uh, in s j. If I have some cover of the entire if, of all the parts, if I have some cover of all the parts that's made from these s's, from choosing a bunch of these s's. Uh, and I take the or of uh, this T of SJ for all J in such a cover, then every part will belong to some SJ in the cover. That means that uh, T will, and, and this T of SJ is going to be equal to T on this part. And since I cover all the parts, if I do the or, I get all the T. I'm just kind of repeating, but I just want to make this. Uh, yeah. Bruno, are you trying to say that this, uh, by covering these SJs, what you're going to cover is this set of M also? Uh, yes. So, so, so these S, each of S, each SJ chooses some of the parts, right? Each SJ chooses some of the parts, right? For example, you could have that uh, S3 equals one, three, and seven, right? And then the set S3 chooses part one, part three, part seven. Yeah. And then TSJ for this, for this S3 in particular, three TS, uh, TSJ is going to be equal to T on these parts that S, SJ selects. And it's going to be zero elsewhere. Right. 
Now suppose that I have a cover of the entire, of all the n parts. I have a cover of all the entire, of all the n parts by some choice of SJs. Let's, let's think of this as the cover. Yes? Suma? Suppose, suppose that I have some, 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 some cover, right? So uh, suppose for instance that S3 union S7 union S10, this equals N. Yeah. So this these three guys are a cover of n. Then if I take the or of these TSJs for all j's in the cover, then you know S3 is going to be equal to T here and zero elsewhere. Uh, S7 is going to be equal to T on some other parts. But the point is that the union of all these parts is the entire, is all the parts. Yes? Okay. So so the entire function is just the or of these TSJs. Okay, good. Uh, all right, and here, but here's a conjecture, which, uh, so now you could come to the following conjecture, which seems reasonable, at least if, uh, if T, it seems reasonable in that way that we can't think of any other way of doing it, which is that if T is random function, if T is a random function, function, uh, then, uh, then the best way yeah, so, so suppose that I give you T of SJ for free, that, that these are gates in your circuit and I give them for free. Then the conjecture would say that the best way of computing T uh, when I'm given for free uh, T of S1 up to T of SU is the above. Meaning I do an OR of the T of SJs. Right. You could actually, if you want to, like, you could make the following, you can make the conjecture, uh, I mean, this is not a very precise statement, but you could make it into a precise statement by saying that, uh, or precise version, precisely, uh, you could say that the size, if I want to compute T and, and TS1 and T of S, you simultaneously, I only need, uh, compared with how many gates I need to compute only the TSJs, uh, this should be roughly the cover size of the family. That's This would be like a precise way of stating this conjecture. Right, so consider how many gates I need to compute T additionally to how many gates I need to compute the TSSJs, all of them. Uh, if, your, if your conjecture intuition says that kind of the best thing that I can do is take the OR of these TSSJs, and, and if that's all I'm doing, then the, I do need like the, how many gates do I need? I need the cover size, right? Because I need to have as many gate, OR gates as the cover. Uh, right. Uh, then your conjecture would state that the size, the, the, the size that I need in order to compute T addition, in addition to computing the, S, the SJs is roughly the cover size. Bruno? And, yes. You're considering here, I guess, binary OR gates, right? Because otherwise oh, just one OR gate would... Yes, start. definitely. Binary, binary, binary. Yeah. Yeah. Family binary. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, otherwise you could count, you should count this with the wires maybe. Uh, that would also work. Uh, right, so, okay, and, uh, if, but, you know, so this is a conjecture, you could state it, is this true, is this false, who knows, actually, but it turns out that this, something like this is very difficult to prove, because it could be that the best circuit to compute S1 and SU simultaneously along the way computes T. There will be some gate in that circuit that computes T, and then this would be false, this would just be zero, right? We don't know that, so we kind of would like to have control over and, and there, here comes the, the next uh, really smart step. And again, this is all uh, Rahul and Igor. Uh, so, uh, so the next really smart step is it, we need some control over how T is computing, and, but we can have that. And, and uh, this is kind of a very smart observation. Uh, let me give you a definition. Um, so if I have some function F, let's say it's a, it's a Boolean function, it accepts M bits and outputs one bit. DNF of F, is the multi-output function, which on input X outputs every gate 
Uh, so it has k outputs, where k is the number of gates in the canonical DNF for f. By canonical DNF for f, what do I mean? I mean it's the or for every, it's the or for every, uh, in fact, it's a binary or, so again, like it's, so it's, so just, so just think it's an or tree. And here, and here I have, uh, you know, uh, is the input, is the input equal to some xi, where the xi's are all the guys where f is one, right? It's just, it's just the, when you prove that every Boolean function has a DNF, that actually gives you a DNF, let's call that DNF the canonical DNF for f. It's just the or of the ones of the function, right? That is some circuit. This DNF is some circuit, uh, if you write it as Boolean gates in some standard way. Now, if look at all the gates in that circuit, okay, then DNF of f is the function which on input 0, 1 to the m outputs every bit that appears as an output of any gate in that circuit. Yes? Maybe let's make a drawing. So uh, let me make another drawing. So, uh, and with binary, we we mean fan in too. Fan, yeah, by fan in too. Yeah. So yeah. this came the same kind of circuits that we considered, right? So, so I have f, right? F we all know has some DNF. It's the or for uh, it's the or for all z uh, in the in f minus one of one. And here we have some gates that that checks if the input x equals z, right? Where x is the input, right? We all know this construction, of course. Yeah. So, but uh, what I'm I'm not sure. Do you know what construction I'm referring to? You do at this point. Uh, are not binary gates in where you have drawn. They're not binary gates. So no, no. So this is an or of ors of ors of ors, yes. and uh, this time implementing again using binary gates. So it's an and of and of ands, uh, and then I have a comparison. Of for each individual bit, right? So it's this circuit. This circuit exists, we all know what it is, and it has some gates. And DNF of F, DNF of F is the, oh, I'm, I'm running out of time. Oh, shit, uh, uh, is that, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, so okay. yeah, I'm taking- You can take another 10 minutes or so. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up in 10 minutes. Sorry, guys. Um, so DNF of f is the circuit which it's the function which on input x outputs the output of all of these gates in the circuit. Okay. And uh, right. And it turns out uh, it turns out that you can prove the following lemma, and it's intuitively true, and it's actually not hard to prove. So, in any circuit which simultaneously computes, uh, and here's the point. So if I have a circuit that computes out all of these functions, I mean the smallest circuit that that outputs all of these functions is actually this one. It's a circuit that computes all of these functions, and they're connected as in the DNF. And this you can actually prove rigorously. It's basically, you know, all of these functions can be used with each other in order to compute all of these functions. And uh, if you need to output them, then you're going to have a gate in the circuit that outputs each of them. And then you might as well not have any more gates because you don't need any more gates, right? And, uh, and, and this like rigorously, you could say that in any circuit, which, and this is true if you have many DNFs, right? So in any circuit which simultaneously computes a bunch of these uh, DNF of FIs, or FJs, there will exist a single gate in each circuit for each unique gate appearing in the canonical DNFs of all of these guys. That means that I kind of have control. If, if, if. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Why isn't it, this just a true table? Uh, no, this isn't just a truth table, right? So, so. Okay, why uh, not? So the truth table of f is just a single bit, right? It's one zero zero zero. That would be f. Sure. But I'm sure, requiring but this, you to this output. Is, yeah. But the or the or combines all the ones, right? The or combines yes. The or but, of all the truth table lines. Yeah, sorry, but I but all of these gates in the circuit, I'm considering them to be output gates, as well. Okay. Yeah. So oh yeah. So so they so they combine different sets of ors of the truth table. Yeah. Yes. The yeah, different sets here, of ones of the truth table. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, but it, it, below here, there is some function. It doesn't necessarily have to be one of the truth table of f at all. It's just some partial. Equality. That's the input, right? That's that's the input line, right? No, the inputs are here. So this would be like the comparison. Yeah, but this is this case. is the end of the input lines, of, of which. The, the two table outputs once. 
Uh, yes. So for each okay. for each one input of f, you have an equality gate here at the bottom. Right. 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 And this equality gate is implemented using ands and ors, but all of the subgates in this equality gate are also considered to be outputs of the NF. Well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And now you can see that in any circuit that simultaneously inputs all of these gates, you basically need to have the, the, the DNF there. This gives you control over what the circuit looks like. And uh, you can actually prove now like a, uh, an analog of this, this, uh, this lemma, right? So maybe we can't prove this, that the, the, the extra size that you need uh, in order to compute T, if you're given all the T of SIs is approximately the cover, but here is what you can prove, okay? If T is a random function, then with high probability, the cover size is actually equal to this difference, right? It's how many extra gates you need to compute T if you are given for free all of the, all of the gates in all the DNFs of this T of SJs. Okay, and, that, and that's a very precise statement, and this is actually now true. This is kind of like a chain rule. It's kind of saying that this condition, like this is the conditional size, well, right, right. it looks like a chain rule, right? Because it's kind of the expression for conditional. It's a size of T given DNF, uh, the DNFs of all the guys. Right? And, uh, and that's how you prove it. We have that. still a question about the lemma. The lemma gives the impression to express the fact that basically the minimal circuit for this entire family of uh, canonical DNFs is um, putting the circuits next to each other and removing duplicates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a classical result in the early circuit theory already going back to the 70s, which tells that the minimal um, circuit for a disjoint of family is not necessarily the union of the minimal circuits. Uh, I didn't know this, but are these inputs, is it like it's a minimal circuit for what? Uh, something having to do with the uh, violation of the rule that if you have two disjoint functions, the minimal circuit complexity for ah, ah, but they're on this the combined input. circuit is not necessarily at least the sum of the two circuit sizes. I've forgotten the name which was attached to it, but I remember it from with my roommate at um, Cornell when I went there as a postdoc in 74, had written a master thesis about the subject. <laughs> yeah, so, so there are things like this, but let me, let me just ask, do you mean that if you want to compute f of x and g of y simultaneously, where yes. x and y are disjoint inputs, then you might do with fewer gates than the sum of the gates for f of x plus the sum That's of the vaguely gates. the way I remember the result. Right, and I it's and in the master of thesis of Volk van Paal, but it's more than 50 years ago, <laughs> or more than 45 years ago, so I hardly remember the details. What's his name? So there's a bunch of results like this, actually. Uh, that's true. But this is different, right? So here we're talking about but computing. You are like talking here about days. very special functions, so it may make a difference. Right, right, and it does indeed. You so, proved so the, the lemma prove or is it in the literature? Uh, we proved it, but it's not very hard. It's just, look, so in any circuit that simultaneously includes all of these guys, there will have to be a gate for each unique gate appearing in these, because each unique gate appearing in these DNFs is supposed to be an output. So there has to be a gate in the circuit for each of them. Right, that's just a requirement because yeah. all of these guides are output. Now, if the gates are there, then you might as well connect them in the usual way and that will add no more gates. So that's actually the size of the circuit. Uh, uh, and now we've added no more gates. So, uh, I mean, that, that's kind of, you might as well do that and that will cost you nothing. And so that's, that's kind of the proof. Uh, all right, so, so maybe, maybe after. So let me just kind of at least give an idea of how to prove this chain rule uh, in five minutes. Uh, so, oh, this is okay. So, all right. So, so right, let me let me try and do a proof by drawing. So, 
Uh, okay, so let's let's let the cover let the cover number of these SIs be something like four L. So so L is one quarter of the cover number. Okay. Now suppose let's suppose that uh, let's suppose that this number here, this difference here, is actually very small. So the size, let's say that the size of T and all the DNFs. Uh, um, is at most the size of the DNFs plus uh, uh, L. Okay. Now, okay. So uh, now, the by the lemma in any circuit that computes uh, these DNFs, they will have to. So in the circuit that computes T simultaneously with these DNFs, by this lemma that this circuit will need to have one gate for each of them, for each of the DNFs, right? So you might have gates G1, G2, and these are the gates that just, that just appear in these DNFs, and they have to be there. And what I'm saying is that in order to compute T, I can do so uh, with only L extra gates. That means that I can write T as a circuit that has like L gates, and as input, I might have the Xs, well, I'll, I'm going to have some G, some G1 up to G2L. Some G1 up to G2L. Uh, and this uses this lemma. And, and, now, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that the number of Ts that are of this form is actually small. And I'm going to do this by encoding them in some small description. And here's the key, here's the key point. So these gates here are gates that come from the DNFs of these TSIs somewhere. And the point is that DSIs, I only have two L of SIs. And uh, if I have, you know, let's suppose that DSIs are S1 up to S2 uh, L. Because the cover number is at least for L, then that means that the size of this thing is less than n minus 2L uh, because, uh, so, so meaning that the S's that whose DNFs appear as input gates to this guy, they only cover something like n minus 2L, uh, n minus 2L. Uh, Why do you have two L's? Because it's the, same two, it's the same two L's here. Oh. If you only have L nodes, yes. number of inputs is at most L plus one. Uh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Actually, you can, that's right, yeah, indeed. Uh, but I, so I, I guess the, the, you can make this count uh, tighter uh, and get it L plus one, that's right. Uh, but it's kind of too L because if you have L gates, each of them has two inputs and you're kind of roughly, you know, saying <laughs> it's just, it's enough for the argument, so. Uh, but right, you're right, you can actually, this too well is, is kind of overshooting. You don't, you can get L less, yeah. But the, the reasoning, the simpler reasoning is you have L gates, each of them has two inputs, so at most two L inputs in total. Okay, so, all right, so I guess the point I want to make, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, because people might have to go to lunch. So, so the point I have to make is that uh, these, the S's that correspond to these gates cannot cover all of the parts. You have N parts, right? But they cannot cover all of the parts. It turns out that this is going to be, and now you need to use the R boundedness, that this is going to be like one minus one over uh, two R or something times N. So these S's, these S's only cover a few of the parts. And if they cover only a few of the parts in order to describe T, I only have to describe these parts. There's a bunch of parts that I don't need to describe. And, uh, and if I don't need to describe these parts, then, you know, the, the description turns out to, in the end to be short, and that's the proof. I'm sorry that I've gone over so much. All right, uh, I'll leave it at that. So, so yeah, so it's kind of the idea is, is this. So you have the circuit, it depends on a few of the S's, but few of the S's can only cover so much of all the parts. And if, and if you don't need information about all the parts, you can encode T succinctly. But if you can encode T succinctly, then it's not random. So for a random T with high probability, uh, you won't be able to express it only, ha having only L extra gates beyond the DNFs. That's enough. 
Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we're done because I'm sorry for going over so long, so much time. It's the first time. Okay. I Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bruno.